Otto Bunkanga lives and works in Antwerp. Her solo exhibitions include Castello di Rivoli, Museo d'Arte Contemporanea, Rivoli Torino, which is upcoming, Middlesbrough Institute of Modern Art, Martin Gropius Bau in Berlin, Henny Onsted Kunstenster in Hovicodden, Zeitz Mocha in Cape Town, Tate Sanai, Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, amongst others. Additionally, her work has been included in institutional group exhibition, such as the 58th Venice Biennale, Charger Biennale 14, Documenta 14, Moderna Musee in Stockholm, Centre Pompidou in Paris, the 13th Biennale de Lyon. In 2019, Kanga received a special mention award at the 58th International Art Exhibition of La Biennale di Venezia, and was also awarded the Charger Biennial Prize with Emeka Ogbo. That same year, she also received the Peter Weiss Prize, and the Flemish Cultural Award for Visual Arts, Ultima. Hello, Otto, how are you? <laughs> Hi, Carolyn. I'm very well, and you, how are you? You look good. <laughs> I'm fine. I'm, I'm uh, as you can see, appearing and disappearing uh, because of how the light falls with the digital background. And uh, you have a very interesting background, I think, that you chose, uh, which contrasts highly with the pattern that, that I chose and we chose for this program, Digital PTSD. Uh, maybe uh, we could start this conversation with asking you about that very intriguing background. <laughs> I, it's actually quite funny because the background actually works perfectly well with uh, Claudia Conte's um, background, the lines kind of flow, and she talks about after nature and, and kind of like renders it um, almost to lines. And with this work, actually, the, the, it's a photographic work I took in the dead fly in Namibia. And it's actually a microscopic image. I zoomed in, it's almost a macro. I zoomed into this dried sand um, and it's really a small patch and you wouldn't notice it when you walk, but as you walk, you see that there are layers of dried sand that create another kind of landscape. And so when I took this picture, I didn't realize how the image was quite um, impactful for my work. And later when I got back home and I was looking at the image and it just blew me, you know, took me into other worlds. And I was looking at it, I was just, I could be in Mars, I could be on Earth, I could be anywhere. But it just, um, it just shows the kind of um, um, power that the landscape leaves, so things, how things are designed within a landscape. So it's, it's I, I love this just a position of like um, Claudio Conte's um, work next to this because it actually works very well. And actually the dead fly is an area that had water and it's totally dry. You have dead trees and it's really almost about after nature. It's really about something that existed where there was water and then all of a sudden dried out and you have just traces and of water by leaving this kind of demarcation on the land you feel that there was water or it rained and then it dried out mm. so I feel both actually work quite well together in different ways mm. of like portraying or talking about it yes now that uh, introduction of yours right now uh, is such that it appears, or it could appear, at first glance, that inviting you to discuss the digital, or the digital, the potential digital trauma, or the trauma of the digital uh, revolution, is absurd, uh, because your work seems very far uh, from this uh, uh, investigation. I mean, earlier today, we spoke with um, Ed Atkins, whose entire oeuvre is made except for some uh, drawings and paintings that he's made on his laptop. And, um, or, or Janet Cardiff and George Bruce Miller, who basically anticipated augmented reality with their audio and video walks uh, 20 years ago. So <clears throat> in this case, uh, we, we however wish to invite you precisely because of this uh, seemingly a very strong distance and contrast with the digital revolution. 
Uh, and I, I want to know why you accept it <laughs> to, be, to be on a Zoom conversation about the excess of digital life. I mean, does, what does that, um, how does that segue into your interests or well, disinterests? I, Sorry. Yeah, I wouldn't say that one is, I'm, I'm separate from it. You know, um, when I think of leaving Nigeria, moving into Europe, um, and you know, in the 90s, when I came in, came to Europe and I was studying in Paris, the, the only way of communication with family, um, being in contact with friends or people was through the letter and through the telephone. And what it's done over time is um, having that possibility of communication and of also being, um, how do you say, Simon, feeling that you are in another place at the same time, um, listening to the evolution of language, the evolution of food, people, through the digital means. I, I think that has also influenced the work. So they, we can't say that we're separate from it. We, we, we are constantly connected to it, especially when you're in the diaspora and you have family mm -hmm. elsewhere. And that connection allows you to also understand the world in its complexity. And I think in my work, it might not manifest directly with, um, you know, um, uh, a work that is looking at AI or, or working with game engines or things like that. But my interest is in it is also very important to understand how the world functions and how energy is transferred from one material into another, um, how labor is sometimes invisible, and that is invisible also with digital uh, platforms, um, but also how this digital um, um, platforms also allow for connectivity and understanding of, of other places. Um, but I think the management of working with this kind of platforms also comes with um, understanding how it works and also how to um, take care of the way that you work with it, or the way that, or to understand the materials that make it possible for us to even have this communication in the first place. And what that is doing to other certain local localities in the world, so. Are you referring to the um, materials that are used in, in the hardware, from copper to various materials that become our computers and laptops and iPads and iPods and cell phones? Are you referring to the invisible uh, labor and the exploitation of minerals and things in the world that uh, people don't think about? Or the ecological uh, concerns with the, uh, for example, the uh, use of an enormous amount of energy to cool down the technologies? Is that what you're talking about? Everything. It's it. We cannot separate one from the other. We cannot separate the fact that you know we are using this material. We have our phones. We have our computers. We have electricity. We have all these things that um, demand a certain amount of um, material. And where are those materials coming from? And also to talk about the invisibility mm -hmm. of the labors that are behind the possibility of this working, um, of multiple things being constantly in function, 24 hours, seven days a week. What does that mean? Um, it also talks about, I mean, it, it enters, it shows actually the kind of, at the same time, opening certain kind of connectivities, but at the same time, shutting down the possibility of visibilities of places of extraction. At the same time, talking about the material itself or the structures, I think when Vincent, or what's his name, the guy that yes, talked- Yes, uh, Vincent Hendricks. Vincent Hendricks talks about this machine that is constantly luring you in and you become the product. And, yeah. and so that means that you're constantly being ex the extraction, which is not only a mineral extraction, but it's also the extraction of time the extraction of knowledge, the extraction to be able to create capital. And so for all this, you, I mean, um, 
it's it's normal that we do get tired. It's normal that we do get exhausted because it's not just um, a simple extraction, but it's an extraction that transforms and becomes capital. And that capital is also used in a way to um, suppress or, or this at the same time to give profit and gain to certain people or corporations or nations and states. Yeah. So, um, but how so does that, that, if I may, oh, sorry, you were yeah. finishing. Yeah. No, how does that um, lie at the core of your work? I often think uh, that your work ha combines this attention to materials and materialities mm -hmm. and why matter matters, uh, the threads, the ink, the, the processes where the thread and the ink and the colors come from, revealing these hidden invisible uh, labors and of extraction, um, valuing material as if they were the bodies, the body of the world and the body of people. <clears throat> but at the same time, the images that are drawn often have these lines that are connecting one thing to another. And I've always thought that these lines had something to do with a visualization of our culture of connectivity also. So I, I wanted to know what, how this discussion that we're having uh, it turns into your art. I mean, uh, or does it? Or it, does it have nothing to do with why you make work? Oh, I think everything does <laughs> really has to do with it because when you move from one place to another and I've had the privilege to be in different parts of the world or to be in Bangladesh and being in Bangladesh and you see the 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 brick and you know the brick um, structures um, and you can imagine yourself seeing let's say the factories in Tilburg in the Netherlands that have the engines of the 19th century um, so you're, you're moving constantly in space, being in the future, being in the present and being in the past. And some places are already telling us what our future is going to be. So I'm interested in, in these kinds of ways in which the realities of being in the world and being in multiple places, um, you're constantly reflecting and questioning um, what the existence, what is our existence in this planet? Um, what are we doing? Where are we going? And what position do you take? Because um, you're in multiple worlds with different kinds of cultures and different kinds of approaches and ways of thinking in the world. So you're slaloming between these different worlds. And for me, I think the work or making work, you know, if I th to talk about the work calved to flow, was really a way to put together my thoughts and also the thoughts of different people I'm working with and to understand the kind of, um, um, how do you say, parallel um, possibilities of being in a place that is nourishing, but at the same time in a place that is charred. And what does that mean in relation to regeneration? So I think all these different approaches of thinking of emptiness, a place that is holed out into a place that of places of erection, um, you're constantly thinking of that movement or the line that connects the subterranean kind of um, ways of looking. I think one of the people that I was very much interested in reading was very uh, Saskia, um, was it Saskia? Saskia, Saskia Sassin, yes. Yeah, about um, on, on expulsions and also yes. thinking about um, um, subterranean connections of things that would we imagine that maybe a prison in America, how is that connected to a mining zone in Namibia? We might not see the connection, but for me, that's a lot of ways I'm thinking in the work. Like, okay, if I'm holding this piece of soap, for example, or piece of yes, copper. To talk about the soap, for example, the Documenta 14 project. So, the Documenta 14 project, I mean, the soap was a way of unfolding, breaking open and to talk about geographies, to talk about soil, to talk about economy, to talk about laws, um, to talk about circular economies, different kinds of economies, to talk about support systems. And it's a way of connecting dots of different places in the world and, 
and connecting it and making a, a line and different narratives that can connect the chartness of a place, the economy linked to a monoculture, linked to migration, linked to your mobile phone, linked to the water you drink, linked to the clothes you're wearing. So it's and a very global, let's say it's an art of the era of globalization based, however, not on the dominant narrative, but uh, more than Saskia Sassen, it makes me think of Susan Buck Morris also, um, Hegel and Haiti and so forth, where she always gives importance to uh, oral, oral knowledges and things that have happened, connections that have happened that you don't find documents to document. You don't find paper documents. So normal historians would not look at them, but there actually is the connection between Hegel's um, theories, uh, for example, the master-slave text, and uh, the question of French Revolution and Haiti and so forth. So uh, I think it would seem that that you you visualize in your work, but not just visualize in terms of drawings and Im Im image making, but also in the connections you make with different people that you work with, you kind of make visible these uh, hidden patterns or hidden yeah, connections. It, yeah, but, I think it's because you don't, you don't exist. I mean, you don't exist alone. The knowledges that I have has not come from just myself. They've come from multiple experiences, places, people. And it's very important to be able, I mean, I always think about that notion of appropriation and things that you take from many places without even kind of relating to that place and giving that kind of relationship that happens. And I think that is a very fundamental, strong approach that came with like colonialism mm. in which you know, things were taken, but you kind of separated from the places of yes. origin. Yes. And and that's what capital does. And that's what colonial, you know, that combination together works very strongly. The, 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 the erasure, the invisibility of all those things um, um, makes it possible to enjoy something without understanding the pain or the loss within another space. Yes, I understand. Uh, for example, the cotton, the spinning jenny, which would have introduced the industrial revolution in Europe, uh, because it, it made producing cotton very cheap, but actually it was also connected with put, putting extremely high taxes on cotton in India to yes. actually make the spinning jenny produced cotton um, competitive. Yes, Though exactly. these are some examples of this. Let's go back, however, because I think we're going off onto a conversation about everything that interests us, which is what we usually happens when we talk. But honing it back to this evening, at least it's evening here where, where I am in Torino and where you are, I think. Uh, what struck me about your work ever since I came across it the first time, I think it was in the Kwangju Biennale. Um, there was a beautiful, in Maria Lindt, uh, uh, there was a big um, tapestry piece. Uh, that might have been, it might be the first time, I'm not sure. Uh, what really always strikes everyone about your work is the attention to materials and the transformation of materials, which connects with Torino because of Arte Povera. And I know I always say this when we talk, but uh, I was very happy to learn and astonished also that you had somehow ended up studying a little bit, at least a little bit of time with Penone in Paris when he was teaching. So this um, tradition of being very attentive to materials and their energies mm -hmm. and their transformations uh, is something that is very important to us here. So in terms of a digital trauma, I mean, what's mm -hmm. happened during the lockdown because of the uh, COVID, of course, which we all want to eradicate. I hope everyone gets vaccinated as soon as possible. But the COVID lockdown uh, accelerated the digitalization, which was already ongoing, to somehow 
uh, increase the time spent paying attention, as Hendrix said, online. Uh, your work runs parallel, I mean, to the emergence of the internet. It, it starts, you know, in the 90s and 2000s, but it seems so much in contrast as if you were waging your own, not a war, how do we say, your own um, alternative vision of why matter matters. But it's extremely strong within the digital age. And as if it were contrasting that somehow intentionally. So do you, why is it that, that you love, you know, touching the, the, the fibers and, and touching the body of the world? Hmm. Ah. I, th I think we're still made of flesh. <laughs> we're still made of blood. We still die. Um, we still have, you know, things that remind us of our own physicality, no matter what, even with this crisis, we are still reminded that we can be between life and death, that, um, yeah. we, that, you know, no matter what, even if we have the digital world, which allows us to communicate with other people, but you wake up in the morning and you're confronted with yourself and you're protecting yourself from other beings that exist that might kill you, which is the virus, which is, could be a bacteria, which could be many things. So the organic, the, the matter is not, is not taken away or is not, um, does not disappear with the digital. We're, and I think it was interesting listening to um, Vincent because he says we touch our face and our bodies um, over 26,000 times a day, you know, like we're constantly um, reminded of this, of this thing through life and through death. And, and, and we forget or we try to believe that we're beyond, but we're just human beings that are slowly decaying. And I'm interested in that place that, you know, technology evolves. And with that evolution, we don't know what we're going to get in the future. But at the same time, I also see the fragility of the technologies we have because they're connected to servers, they're connected to electricity. And we have the other side of life, which is hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, all kinds of things that render that technology extremely fragile. Um, so we build all the server domes, all this, you know, um, storage houses where we store all these things. And, but at the same time, you see how fragile with Fukushima, with, you know, yeah. so constantly between this world of thinking of places of fragility and that fragility is constantly inherent in the places we live. But I think, um, you know, when I read also someone like um, from Cleopatra to what's her name again, that writes about the Dionysian, the part which is very much linked with the female, mm -hmm. with the part that is um, not understandable. And then thinking about the Polonian side, which mm -hmm. wants to control and which wants to. So we're in this world of clashes of matter and on the other side of the control of matter. And I'm interested in that, to be able to um, understand that there is, that we are extremely fragile within this kind of arrogance of, mm. uh, of a world that we feel we can control, but at the same time, by just pulling the plug, <laughs> it's, which is off the yeah. plane's the computers, you know, it, everything just can't switch off in one second. In one second by pulling a plug. That simple. So how do you see the future? How do you imagine it? I think for me, the way I, I, I see the future is that, you know, we, um, we, we like, you know, when he, um, I'm, I'm thinking about this thing of the addiction towards digital world, our computers, our phones, all those kind of things. But I'm also thinking that the thing that can actually get us and finish us off <laughs> in a way is not actually this part of you know our phones and being mentally ill or all that, but it's it's this collective microorganisms that they're invisible. 
that are entering into multiple places. And you mean the, the viruses, for example? Viruses, bacteria. I mean, even the trees, like in forests, they're having problems with forests because the amount of um, bacteria or the kind of leeches and all kinds of things that are growing are killing a lot of trees at one go. And so uh, the technology is to find ways in which we can um, make sure that the trees are more resistant. Yeah, but look we're not able. I mean, look in the Lecce, in the, in the Puglia, in Italy, almost all the olive trees have died. Yeah. Almost all of them. And it's a terrible disease that, that, it will, that moves. And, and with all the technology and all the big data and analysis, nobody seems to be able to uh, save the olive trees. Yeah, because I think by design and design of the places where we invest in um, um, economy, invest in energy, except, uh, invest in capital, is completely in thinking that technology or like thinking that this is the only place that can actually shift our future. The way you would read things in economic, or for, economic forum or in all the, you know, it's about the new technology is the thing that is going to save us. It does save us partially, but the core of where things should be invested in is not being invested in. Um, so, so you I, mean it's in ecological issues around um, the balance between the organisms? It's not yeah. being taken care of. I think it's it's the ecological. It's linked with the ecological, and that ecological can leave in symbiosis with the technological. It, it's not one or the other. Of course. Well, that's what Donna Haraway has always stated, of course. But it depends what we want. I mean, the, the, the forces that shape the world and the economy, it depends where they're going to move. I mean, in, in what directions as well. Yeah, but I think I, the way I see it, and you asked me about how I see the future, the, yeah. the way I see it, um, um, it might it might be a, a hard line, or I don't see. I see there are beautiful things that will happen. There are young, you know, younger generations that will um, have a faster pace of understanding how to deal with this world. But at the same time, I'm looking at regions that do not have. Um, that have been decimated yeah. by extractions that have been um, that are bearing the grunt of different industrial to you know um, tech, um, digital kind of um, uh, explorations that have happened, and many of those places in the world do not have the kind of resources to be able to cope with the the this imbalance that is happening. So I, I don't believe everybody will have the same kind of future. Some futures will be better than others. And some will be, you know, um, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, okay. <laughs> Be before we, we end, um, maybe it could be nice to understand what you're talking about in relation to one piece that, that we're making, you know, which is that you're making, which is a big, uh, let's say, installation or landscape or alternate, alternative geography in the horizontal and on the floor of the Castello di Rivoli. If you, we could connect somehow what we're talking about with what you're doing, that would be very interesting because I, I, there are ropes that travel through the galleries and they're very special and they connect rugs and the rugs have certain images and they're objects and things. And I've always seen your description of these objects as somehow a kind of um, gym to recover embodied experience after the pandemic. Yeah, the way I was thinking about this work, I think it continues from the place of um, trying to make a, a, a kind of environment, you know, that would allow for um, breathing in a different way. Um, and I imagine that I, 
I'm trying to imagine how I would want my house to be. Hmm. First, please. So I, I'm someone that loves the horizontal. I work a lot. My husband would vouch for that sometimes. In bed, I could lie. I could stay in bed all day and reply to mails and even draw in bed. Right. I love that kind of or on the floor. So a lot of the drawings are made on the floor. I don't work on the wall. I lie on the floor and I draw. So that kind of the flatness of the ground. And then I would then um, lie on my back to get the energy from the ground. Um, and that's one of the methods of like relaxing and putting your back against the ground and breathing to be able to recuperate and kind of resource yourself. And the best will be on, it would be on, on soil itself, just lying on soil. Um, and then um, I was also thinking of that relationship to place and even I'm in Torino um, to think about what kinds of elements are, that are from the mountains from the the city itself that are used for um, cleansing the air so there are all those vessels and cords I call them cords and vessels that are containers of things to cleanse um, the cords that connect almost like the voice or your umbilical cord or the cords or the, the, the lines that go through your body. Um, so I'm thinking of it in that way as something that you can experience. You could bend down the body, um, shift into a position of bending down to the floor. Um, so not constantly being in that horizontal, but lying, bending. So it's really engaging the body in a way that is more performative somehow. Um, and so I was thinking of something that is, yeah, more, how do you say, that is not trying to look at the world from that dark place, but create a work that I can slip in and relax in and offer that to people that come through that exhibition. A place where the brain relax, where the body shifts its perception, because we've been um, so much, or well, maybe I'll talk for myself because I don't know about many people go for walks and all that. Um, but I've been a lot on the computer, working in my studio, um, um, dealing with family calls, Nigeria, you know, like friends. So I'm a lot on long distance conversations because of where my love lies or where my family lies and where people that I care about lie. And and so that kind of missing something that can make you relax or find, you know, that you, the tension goes down was important to make a work that connects to that. Fantastic. So basically, uh, we're going to lie down in your exhibition that will yeah. open in September. So yeah. the, the um, healing of the, if there is any digital PTSD of being on Zoom too much, is uh, not sitting. It's interesting because when I talk to people who work in uh, jobs that have a lot to do with digital, mm -hmm. they say, sit down and work. That's their expression. You know, in, in the past, we would say, get up and work. Mm -hmm. And now, sit down and work, as if just sitting there and typing. So now you're saying, lie down and relax. It's very yes. interesting, very, very interesting, very radical. So uh, thank you so much. I mean, radical in the good sense. You know, radice uh, comes from Latin. It means the root, the yes. roots of the tree. So, yes. <laughs> okay. Yes. So, thank, thank you, you so much for being with us. Grazie mille. Prego, prego. And in a short while, I think there's, um, the next talk will be Catherine Malabou. Uh, and then we'll end with Tabitha Rizair's um, incredible uh, relaxation uh, pro program that she's prepared for us to, to end the evening. Okay. Ciao.
Otto Bonkanga was in conversation with Caroline Christoph Bakarjiev. Nkanga's practice reads the world on material terms, mapping out how the body fits into a shared earthly narrative. In this conversation, the artist spoke with Caroline Christoph Bakarjiev about digital PTSD in connection to alienated labor, material extraction, as well as digital addiction triggered by the loss of embodied relations accentuated by the pandemic. During the talk, they also addressed the importance of Kanga's polysensorial approach to exhibition making and their research into capitalist production cycles, which extract and shift energy from organic materials to inorganic, invisible and intangible spaces, making up the apparently seamless infrastructure of the digital world. <laughs> 